Hello everyone and a warm welcome to this extra section specifically devoted to the 12th edition of this Refining is Exciting Massive Open Online course, which focuses on the process of producing biofuels using bio-based materials. In the previous sections, our attention was directed towards the fundamental stages involved in producing bionaphta, biojet and biodiesel. For this section, my proposal is to center our attention on the carbon intensity of these biofuels. The production of these biofuels necessitates the use of gas, which is burnt in heaters, along with electricity required for pumps and compressors, as well as steam. We will start by the pre-treating stage and perform all calculations based on the 100 tons per hour processing throughput. As previously mentioned, we require approximately 10 tons per hour of steam to heat the bio-based materials to the appropriate temperature. Additionally, there will be pumps involved in the process that consume electricity as well as centrifuge and our estimate for their usage stands at 700 kilowatts. In regards to the HTT hydro deoxygenation stage, it's worth noting that we generate steam, which is subsequently consumed in the stripper. Overall, the net balance results in a steam production of approximately 21 tons per hour. Accounting for the energy usage of the pumps and compressors, the total electricity consumption amounts to around 4.8 megawatts. Similar deductions can be made for the HDI stage, which results in electricity consumption of roughly 700 kilowatts, steam consumption of 1.5 tons per hour in the stripper, and a gas consumption of approximately 0.3 tons per hour. It's also crucial to take into account the amine unit. As a reminder, the recycled gas from the HDT stage is washed with an amine, and this amine must be regenerated using steam. The estimated steam consumption for this process is 10 tons per hour. Consequently, at the bottom of the page, we can observe a steam requirement that is nearly negligible, an electricity consumption amounting to roughly 6.3 megawatts and a gas consumption of around 0.3 tons per hour. It's now time to determine the carbon intensity of these bioproducts. Assuming nuclear power is a source of electricity, the carbon footprint can be estimated to be 12 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. However, if the electricity is generated using natural gas in a thermal power plant, the carbon footprint would be about 490 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. The combined quantity of biofuel produced with the total energy value are 6.5 plus 2 plus 82 equals 90.5 tons per hour. We can assume a conventional value of energy of 43 megajoules of energy per kilogram for each of these fuel composed of carbon and hydrogen each. Therefore, we can convert each item into gram of CO2 per hour. For the electricity, for example, the conversion is a simple multiplication by 12 or 490, depending on its source. As for gas, we need to multiply by the emission factor of natural gas, which indicates that for every gram of natural gas consumed, 2.75 grams of CO2 are produced. After performing the calculations, we arrive at the following result. To obtain the carbon intensity values, we divide the gram of CO2 emitted by the energy amount of energy produced, which is 90.5, multiplied by 43 megajoule per kilogram. Therefore, considering the carbon emissions related to the pretreatment process, HGT, HGDI and amine section, the resulting carbon footprint is less than 1 gram of CO2 per megajoule of energy produced. However, we need to take into account the contribution of hydrogen. The carbon footprint of hydrogen varies depending on how it is produced, either from natural gas or water electrolysis, and it can range from 1 to 11 grams of CO2 per gram of hydrogen produced. From this point on, let's assume that we are producing electricity from nuclear sources for the remainder of this video. It should be noted that we consume 3.5 tons per hour of hydrogen which we can use to calculate the amount of CO2 generated. 
The bottom of the page shows a carbon footprint between 1 to 10 grams of CO2 per megajoule of energy, which varies based on the hydrogen source. European regulations specify a range of 10 grams of CO2 per megajoule for used cooking oils to 15 grams of CO2 per megajoule for animal fats, which falls between the same range of values. It is worth noting that the European regulations do not attribute any carbon footprint to the use of used cooking oil and animal fats as raw materials. It is assumed that they do not contribute to the CO2 emissions per megajoule of fuel produced. However, if we were to consider the treatment of vegetable oils directly in competition with food, the regulations stipulate adding about 25 grams of CO2 per megajoule. On the overall life cycle, when biodiesel is burnt, CO2 will be emitted, but since the carbon comes from biomass instead of fossil energy, it is not counted towards the carbon footprint, unlike fossil fuels made from oil. Therefore, throughout its life cycle, this biodiesel will have produced a carbon footprint ranging from 1 to 11 grams of CO2 per megajoule while a conventional fossil fuel emits 94 grams of CO2 per megajoule according to European regulations. To produce fossil fuel, it requires approximately 20 grams of CO2 per megajoule taking into account the emissions from oil extraction, refining and distribution. When burnt, it emits approximately 75 grams of CO2 per megajoule, which is considered as fossil CO2. The final result shows a considerable decrease in emissions depending on the methods used to produce the required electricity and hydrogen for manufacturing this biodiesel. As a conclusion, we can see that these fuels, when produced from green hydrogen and when produced from wastes and residues, significantly reduce CO2 emissions compared to their fossil counterparts. Well, this is the end of this MOOC dedicated to biofuels. Thank you very, very much for your attention and see you very soon for more videos. Bye-bye!